Meanwhile, mixed reactions across the globe from world leaders coming with a swap of prisoners and the release of billions of dollars for Iran. UN Chief Ban Ki moon praising the United States and Iran for working to improve ties, adding he is, quote, heartened by the lifting of sanctions against Iran. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is remaining skeptical, saying that Israel will continue to monitor Tehran closely to ensure it is not violating the commitments of the deal. Let's talk about it now with Mark Dubowitz, Executive Director, uh, Foundation for Defense of Democracies. Good to see you, Mark. How are you? Hi, Arthel. Okay. Um, so how do you see it? I is the deal enforcing a block to build nuclear weapons, or does the deal force Iran to exercise patience? Arthel, the deal itself and its very architecture gives Iran a patient pathway to a nuclear weapon. There are some restrictions on Iran's nuclear program, but those restrictions go away over time. In fact, they begin going away after only eight years. So all the Iranians have to do is be patient and collect hundreds of billions of dollars in sanctions relief, fortify their economy, increase their regional dominance, and after eight years, those restrictions will go away and Iran will have a patient pathway to nuclear weapons capability. Well, let's talk about what happened in the last 24 hours. You've got the American prisoners who were released. Uh, was that, everybody's happy that they're, they were released, but I want to ask you, uh, was the prisoner release the right move? I mean, whether or not it was part of the deal or not, which, you know, apparently the administration says it was not part of the deal. However, there are some who are saying that the timing makes it appear that Iran got paid for releasing the American prisoners. I think that was absolutely the case. I mean, remember, this Iranian regime has been taking hostages for over 30 years. It is part of their M.O. And uh, the more hostages they take, the, the more they get paid, uh, the more it creates an incentive to take more hostages. And so, unfortunately, we have a situation where, you know, thank God four American hostages are going to be coming home. But in return, we're giving up 21 Iranian criminals, including two gentlemen who are the head of the Revolutionary Guards Air Force, which is being used to supply Bashar Assad and Hezbollah and has been uh, wrecking havoc across the Middle East. So is there anything good about this deal, in your opinion? Well, I think that the one good aspect of the deal is what it's done with the plutonium uh, heavy water reactor. I think it's put some restrictions on that heavy water reactor uh, that at least should last uh, over a decade, maybe 15 years. So that aspect of the pathway that Iran has to a nuclear weapon, I think, has been curtailed. But Iran still has significant enrichment capability over time that will allow it to actually break out or sneak out to a nuclear weapon, hundreds of billions of dollars to fortify itself, become increasingly impervious to our ability to use economic sanctions. And when we face down Iran in 10 years, Iran will be richer. And our, our only ability that we'll have is to use military force. And when that war comes, Iran will be stronger and the consequences will be much more severe. And you, you speak as if that war is imminent. Well, I think that that war will have to come un unless we're willing to concede Iran a nuclear weapon. And I think the idea of having the leading state sponsor of terrorism with, with nuclear weapons is something that no U.S. president will be able to countenance. So unfortunately, military force may end up being the only option, which is too bad because we had significant economic leverage, which we traded away for, I think, what, what many in the region consider to be a deeply flawed deal. And you say, Mark, that the uh, Iran Revolutionary Guard is the biggest beneficiary. The Revolutionary Guards control Iran's nuclear program, their ballistic missile program, support for terrorism, they're supporting Bashar Assad, but they also control all the key strategic sectors of Iran's economy. And so when the sanctions are lifted and all these companies go back into Iran, they're going to invariably do business with Iran's Revolutionary Guard, which is now stands to make hundreds of billions of dollars, part of which it'll use to fund more terrorism, develop more ballistic missiles, and, and wreak even more havoc across the Middle East. Was there something else the U.S. should have done? I think so. I, you know, in 2013, people forget, but Iran was four to six months away from a severe balance of payments crisis leading to economic collapse. And we had, we had great leverage on the Iranians. And we should have ratcheted up the pressure, gone to the negotiating table with even more leverage, and not have diminished our pressure and given away the most valuable concessions to the Iranians, not at the end of the negotiations, but when we did it at the beginning of the negotiations and actually creating an enrichment capacity for, again, the leading state sponsor of terrorism. So we had great leverage, and unfortunately, this administration does not use its leverage. It, ten it tends to trade it away prematurely, and it tends to cut deals, in it, which invariably are bad deals that backfire on the United States. Have to leave it there. Mark Dupowitz, thank you very much.